The Philosophic Corruption of Physics, Lecture 3. Okay, let's start. In the last class, we saw how Kant's ideas quickly made their way to England and had a disastrous effect on physicists' understanding of matter and force. Now I want to go back to the continent and discuss what happened to physics there in the later part of the 19th century. And to set the context, let me first give you a certain perspective on Kant's philosophy. I mentioned earlier that in regard to the concepts of space and time, Kant managed to combine the worst elements of his predecessors while purging every element of truth. Well, he does the same thing in epistemology. Recall that there were two major schools of modern philosophy, the rationalists and the empiricists. Now, each of these schools combined an element of truth with a major error. As I've indicated on the board, the rationalists believed in innate concepts. They thought knowledge started from innate ideas. But they also believed in the efficacy of reason. They thought that these innate ideas enabled us to build on them and actually achieve a knowledge of reality that is not given in sense perception, that goes beyond what we get in sense perception. So they did believe in the efficacy of reason. Now the empiricists, on the other hand, denied the rationalist starting point. They said there are no innate ideas. Knowledge is based on sense perception. So far, so good. But the modern empiricists went on from there to say that knowledge not only starts with sense perception, and in effect it ends with sense perception. Um, knowledge is limited to what they called sense experience, which was not a direct experience of the external world, but rather images in our minds. So this is the skeptical conclusion that the empiricists came to. Now, in order to develop a proper epistemology, what would you have to do? Well, you'd have to take from the empiricist the idea that knowledge is based on the senses, and from the rationalist the efficacy of reason, that reason allows us to go beyond sense perception and gain knowledge of reality that is only available at the conceptual level. What does Kant do? Exactly the opposite, right? He takes the skepticism of the empiricists, combines it with the um, innate concepts of the rationalists. Kant agrees with the empiricists that our knowledge is limited to an inner world of sense experience. But he adds, the world of sense experience is created by our innate concepts. What makes sense experience possible is our mind's innate conceptual rules for synthesizing the manifold of sensations. Kant combined the innate concepts of the rationalists with the skepticism of the empiricists. And notice that the fundamental <coughs> here that unites both of these ideas for Kant is that consciousness is detached from an unknowable reality. Now, the philosophers that followed Kant all accepted his basic premise, but some chose to emphasize the rationalist side of Kant, while other cho others chose to emphasize the empiricist side. Now, we saw that Kant's immediate followers in Germany, the Romantics, chose the rationalist, mystical side. In physics, they thought they could start with innate concepts, the so-called a priori conditions of experience, and deduce or intuit the laws of the phenomenal world. But the Kantian rationalists failed so obviously and dramatically that the tide turned, and German physicists swung over to the empiricist side. The new empiricists accepted Kant's definition of physics as the science that gives mathematical descriptions of appearances. But they thought that Kant was much too optimistic about what could be deduced from the categories. Instead, they said, Scientists must accept the appearances as brute facts and simply describe them without attempting the hopeless task of explaining why the appearances have to be as they are. Now, as some of you know, the dominant 19th century school of Kantian empiricism goes by the name of positivism. The most influential positivist in physics was Ernst Mach. 
Mach spent his career in Prague and Vienna. He was professor of physics at the University of Prague from 1867 to 1895. And then he accepted the chair in philosophy of science at the University of Vienna until his retirement in 1901. And what I want to do, what I want to open with today is discussing Mach's views. Uh, I'm going to start with his philosophy and, and then go into his specific views in physics. And you'll see how Mach's physics follows from his philosophy. So I have a number of points to make about Mach's philosophy here. Um, let me see. Actually, it's another triad. Three. First, Mach was a phenomenalist. Now, Mach, of course, accepts Kant's idea that reason is limited to phenomena, that is, to the manifold of sensation. Not sensations of anything for Mach, just sensations. Now, he describes the crucial point in his early philosophic development um, when he writes, quote, I have always felt it as a special, a stroke of special good fortune that, at the age of 15, I came across a copy of Kant's Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics. The book made a powerful and ineffaceable impression on me, the like of which I never afterward experienced in any of my philosophic reasoning. Or philosophic reading, excuse me. Now, Mach goes on to describe the revelation he had shortly thereafter. Quote, the superfluous role played by the thing in itself abruptly dawned on me. On a bright summer day in the open air, the world with my ego suddenly appeared to me as one coherent mass of sensations, only more strongly coherent in the ego. This moment was decisive for my whole view. Unquote. So, contemplating Kant's phenomenal world brought about a fundamental change in perspective for Mach. Existence and consciousness disappeared. They both dissolved into sensations. The sensations are regarded as neutral, neither mental nor physical. They just are. However, we seem to perceive a world of things around us. Now, what is the status of entities, according to Mach? Quote, a thing is a thought symbol for a compound sensation of relative stability. Properly speaking, the world is not composed of things as its elements, but of colors, tones, pressures, spaces, times, in short, what we ordinarily call elementary sensations. Unquote. Now, of course, this isn't very original. Who does it remind you of? Did somebody say... Hume? Hume, right, exactly. Mach has merely gone back to Hume, but now from a Kantian perspective. Kant's perspective allows Mach to believe that Hume's ideas don't lead to skepticism, but they lead to science. Now, what is science on such a view? Mach identifies its basic goal. Quote, the aim of scientific research is the, is the discovery of the equations which subsist between the elements of phenomena. Now, elsewhere, Mach speaks of science as the math of sensation. Now, he was very high on math because he thought that the equations were the means of describing the sensations in the most economical way. Okay, now this should just remind you of Kant's definition of physics, right? Physics, according to Kant, is simply the mathematical description of appearances. And all Mach has really added to that is that the appearances reduce the sensations. Now, Galileo and Newton had said that the goal of physics was to understand the basic nature of the external physical world. Now, Mach will have none of that. He agrees with Kant and Cardinal Bellarmino that science merely describes appearances and adds that the appearances reduce the sensations. Now notice that one implication of Mach's view is that the distinction between physics and psychology collapses. 
There are no minds perceiving a physical world. Reality is just sensations. For example, considered in isolation, a particular sensation of red is neither mental nor physical. According to Mach, if we think of it in a context that includes the idea of light, then we regard it as physical. On the other hand, if the context includes such ideas as optic nerve, then we regard it as mental. The distinction is merely one of context and perspective. Now, Mach and many of his followers were serious about integrating physics and psychology and applying the same methods to both fields. One colleague of Mach's, Wilhelm Oswald, actually derived the mathematical equation for happiness, which I've written on the board. Uh, I told you I wasn't going to give you too many equations, but I couldn't pass this one up. Happiness equals e squared minus w squared, where e is, the, is energy applied with purpose and success, and w is energy applied with aversion and reluctance. So, take that for what it's worth and be happy. Um, now, the last time I gave this class, uh, someone asked me about the derivation. Um, if anyone is tempted to do that, all I can tell you is that the premises are every bit as arbitrary as the conclusion, so it wouldn't help you. Why the squares? Well, the, the, the squares are actually my favorite part. What, what's your problem with the squares? <laughs> uh, oh, Wilhelm Ostwald. Okay. Um, Second point in Mach's philosophy. Mach rejected Kant's noumenal world. Now Kant had said that the noumenal world was inaccessible to reason, but he still made a place for it in his philosophy. He still spoke of it and even claimed we could access it through our emotions. But Mach rejects the noumenal world entirely. He holds that it is unintelligible to say anything about it, even that it exists. And he equates the whole subject of metaphysics with claims about the noumenal world, or claims about why experience has to be as it is. So metaphysics is thrown out. Quote, I should like the scientists to realize that my view eliminates all metaphysical questions. Everything we can know about the world is expressed in the sensations. Everything we can want to know is given by a mathematical description of the functional dependency of the sensational elements on one another. This exhausts our knowledge of reality. And of course, Mach puts reality in scare quotes. Now furthermore, since philosophy is based on metaphysics, philosophy must also be thrown out. Quote, there is no Machian philosophy. At most, there is a scientific methodology and a psychology of knowledge. The land of the transcendental is closed to me. Okay, trans by transcendental, he means reality, um, Kant's noumenal world. Um, we are trapped in this world of sensations. We cannot be aware of reality. He considers that transcendental. That's one of Kant's terms. Mach continues. And if I make the open confession that its inhabitants the inhabitants of uh, reality, this transcendental world, are not able to excite my curiosity, then you may estimate the wide abyss that exists between me and many philosophers. For this reason, I have declared explicitly that I am by no means a philosopher, but only a scientist." Unquote. Now, this attitude toward philosophy is shared by most physicists today. Mach is one of its main sources, and Kant is its ultimate cause. Kant put reality beyond reason and science, and, and by doing so, destroyed metaphysics and convinced scientists to reject the whole subject. And we can see the irony here. Physicists are so completely and helplessly in the grips of Kant's philosophic ideas that they are blind to the ideas. <laughs> 
to make you unconscious of philosophy by means of your philosophy. Nothing could be more ingenious. Now, many positivists stopped short of rejecting philosophy entirely. They still thought that there was a role for philosophy as the handmaiden of science. In effect, philosophers should act as referees, blowing their whistles when scientists step out of bounds. Now, the boundary encloses the world of appearances. Any claim about the reality beyond the appearances is considered out of bounds. Now, observe that this is the exact opposite of the proper role of philosophy. Philosophers should blow their whistles when abstractions don't refer to reality, not when they do. Now, Mach hints at what the later positivist would regard as the role of philosophy when he writes, quote, Not all problems that arise in the development of science can be solved. On the contrary, many will fall away because one recognizes them as null. By the annihilation of problems that rest on a false manner of asking questions, science takes a fundamental step forward. Unquote. Now, this view has had enormous influence on physics. Uh, one could even say that the annihilation of questions is an essential characteristic of 20th century physics. And we'll see that uh, particularly when we get to quantum mechanics. All right, point number three in Mach's philosophy. Mach was a nominalist. For Mach, concepts are arbitrary groups of sensations or relations among the sensations. Now, we are not forced to name the sensations in any particular way, according to Mach, but he emphasizes that we should do so in the most economical way. Economy of description is Mach's internal criteria of truth. Now, Kant had thought that his innate concepts were the necessary conditions for the possibility of experience, and therefore there was no choice about them. They're hardwired into us, in effect. But Mach rejects Kant's innate concepts. For example, he writes, quote, the law of causality is sufficiently characterized by saying that it is the presupposition of the mutual dependence of phenomena." Unquote. So what was a category for Kant becomes a convenient presupposition for Mach. Otherwise, the idea of causality remains unchanged. It is still viewed as a relation that we impose on phenomena, not a relation between real entities and their actions. Now, however, since some people continue to think of causality in that confused, realist way, Mach concludes, quote, I hope the science of the future will discard the idea of cause and effect as being formally obscure, unquote. Now, notice what a small step it is from Kant's primacy of consciousness view of causality to rejecting the idea altogether. I mean, Kant detached causality from the real world once he does that, um, the philosophers behind him came along, simply denied the necessity of his categories, and then threw out causality altogether. Now, Mach admits that we use concepts that are not names for groups of sensations or their relationships. People use these concepts as though they're referring to something beyond the sensations. Now, in some cases, according to Mach, the concepts should just be rejected. But in other cases, Mach <coughs> admits that the concepts have a certain heuristic value. He claims that they can function as aids to help us remember the relations among the sensation. Um, so, as far as concepts, I mean, I'm going to give you examples later, but right now I just want to say Mach admits that there are many concepts in the language that don't seem to directly refer to sensations. Now, should we just throw them out on his view? Well, a lot of them, he says, we should. But there are some, he says, that have this pragmatic heuristic value that they help us remember the sensations. So, at least uh, on a temporary basis, he's willing to uh, keep those concepts. And Mach writes, quote, 
what we represent to ourselves behind the appearances exist only in our understanding. Such representations have only the value of aids to our memory, whose form, because it is arbitrary and irrelevant, varies easily from the standpoint of our culture. Unquote. Now, according to Mach, many of the theoretical concepts of science have this status. Physical theories employing such concepts can be useful in the first stages of scientific investigation as devices for remembering the sensations. But eventually such theories should be eliminated, leaving behind only the equations describing the sensations. That's the end goal of science. And there's a famous quote from Mach. Um, he writes, The object of natural science is the connection of phenomena but theories are like dry leaves which fall away when they have ceased to be the lungs of the tree of science. So in the end, Mach was against abstract theories, just as you would expect of a modern empiricist. Okay, now, let's, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Mach's physics. And we'll see how Mach applied these ideas to science. Now, it probably won't surprise you to learn that Mach rejected the concept of matter. By matter, we mean the physical stuff that entities are made of. But such an idea transcends sensation, and so it's out. Mach doesn't even think that the concept can serve as a heuristic aid to memory. Quote, To us investigators, the concept soul is irrelevant and laughable. But matter is an abstraction of exactly the same kind, just as good and just as bad. We know as much about the soul as we do of matter, unquote. And by that, Mach meant we know nothing of it. Now, what about concepts of chemical elements? Now, here Mach is willing to accept them, but only as devices for recalling the sensory experiences. He writes, quote, We say that water consists of oxygen and hydrogen, but this oxygen and this hydrogen are merely thoughts or names which, at the sight of water, we keep ready to describe phenomena which are not present but which will appear again whenever we decompose water. Unquote. You get that? When we say that water is made of hydrogen and oxygen, we are not referring to the components of water molecules, according to Mach. We are just referring, for example, to the electrolysis experiments where we see the volume of water decreasing as gases called hydrogen and oxygen bubble up at the electrodes. Now, this is ridiculous, of course. It's like saying that the name Aristotle refers to our sensory experiences as we read about him in a book. And later positivists would say exactly that. Now, on this approach, what becomes of Newton's physics? Well, consider Newton's second law of motion. Force equals mass times acceleration. Now, according to Newton, what this law means is, first, real physical bodies exert real physical forces on each other, causing accelerations. And second, the, uh, <clears throat> the bodies have a property called mass by which they resist acceleration when acted upon by other bodies. Okay, so this is a realist physical interpretation that Newton gives to his famous law of motion, F equals ma. Now, according to Mach, all this is nonsensical talk about things in themselves, just metaphysical hooey. Mach asks, what do we actually observe? And he answers, we observe appearances accelerating. Therefore, the actual empirical content of Newton's laws involves nothing more than the observed regularities and the accelerations of appearances. Now, consider two appearances that interact. Newton tells us that the forces are equal and opposite. So, what that means is that the mass of the first body multiplied by its acceleration has to equal the mass of the second body 
multiplied by its acceleration. Now we can do a little bit of simple algebra and rearrange that equation and see that the ratio of the mass of the first body to the mass of the second body is equal to the acceleration of the second body divided by the acceleration of the first body. In other words, that the ratio of the masses is simply equal to the inverse ratio of the accelerations of the two interacting bodies. Now, for Mach, this is an analytic definition of mass. The ratio of the masses is just defined as the inverse ratio of the acceleration. That is what we mean by mass, according to Mach. The inverse ratio of accelerating appearances. So mass is no longer a real physical property of real physical bodies. Now, what about force? Kant derived the concept of force from his categories, specifically from the category of causality. But the positivists reject these innate concepts. Mach and his followers couldn't find a referent for force in sensations, just as Hume couldn't find a referent for the concept of cause. So the positivists decided that force doesn't have any empirical content either. The equation F equals MA is just an analytic definition of force. In other words, it's true by definition. So the meaning of Newton's laws of motion is reduced to appearances accelerate, and they do so in such a way that if we know how appearances 1 and 2 accelerate when they interact, and we know the same for appearances 1 and 3, then we can predict how appearances 2 and 3 will accelerate when they interact. In other words, the laws just name an observed regularity in accelerating appearances. Now, notice that the phenomenalist view, if adopted consistently, stops physicists from asking any interesting questions. If one considers mass to be a real physical property, there may be much more to know about it. For example, what is the relation between the inertial and gravitational properties of mass? Is there a relation between mass and electric charge, etc.? A primacy of existence approach leads to the view that concepts are open-ended, with much more to discover about their reference. But the primacy of consciousness approach leads to the view that concepts are dead ends. They just refer to items in consciousness, and that's it. The statement, appearances accelerate, doesn't give rise to any question. Now, this is one of the ways that Kant's ideas lead to stagnation in physics. And we'll definitely see that uh, in my last two, in the last two classes of this course on relativity and quantum mechanics. Any questions on Mach so far? Phil? How could all of Mach's rationalizations ex permit him to explain the predictive power of the principles that Newton discussed in the Principia and the Optics. The pre oh, how, the question is, how could Mach explain the predictive power of, uh, <clears throat> for example, Newton's theories, uh, given this uh, this kind of uh, interpretation that he gave to the physics in terms of a mere regulation among uh, sensations? Now, he doesn't have a good answer to that. So that is. Uh, that's the problem faced by anyone who falls back on a Humean foundation in philosophy. Um, now, Hume was more consistent than some of uh, the, <clears throat> the intellectuals that followed him. Hume actually ended in complete skepticism and admitted that his ideas uh, don't allow him to reach any conclusion at all. Remember, there was a comment, there was a quote that I read to you from Hume where he said, I'm no longer able to even consider any opinion as more likely than any other. Uh, so <clears throat> Hume recognized that once you take this primacy of consciousness perspective and you say everything is just, all we can do is associate sensations, there's no way to validate induction and predict the future. 
Uh, Mach was not quite that consistent. He, he didn't give an explanation, or nothing that I think serves as an explanation, and he just took for granted that Newton's laws worked. <clears throat> Brian. Um, well, Popper is a little different, but the the, um, the the question is, what is the relationship between Mach and the later uh, positivists, say, of the Vienna Circle in the 1920s and and 30s? Um, and I would say, uh, same basic ideas, and all of those. Uh, people that made up the Vienna Circle were deeply influenced by Mach. So uh, the relationship was uh, that Mach was, was a major influence on those later thinkers. Okay, well, does Mach rest content after attacking the foundations of Newton's physics? Well, no, I've saved the worst for last. Mach is famous for his incredibly successful attack on one of the crowning achievements of 19th century science, the atomic theory of matter. Now, the theory that all matter consists of differing arrangements of elementary particles called atoms goes back to ancient Greece. In the 17th century, most natural philosophers believed that matter was probably composed of atoms, or corpuscles, as they like to call them. They believed it mainly because the theory seemed to be the simplest way to explain the incredible diversity of things that we see in nature. It seemed plausible that the variety of things we see around us could be explained as complex arrangements of a relatively small number of atoms. To deny the atomic theory seemed to force one into the unsatisfying conclusion that there were literally thousands of irreducibly different materials. If the job of the scientist was to find the underlying simplicity in nature, the atomic theory held out the potential for doing just that. So that is by way of explanation as to why so many scientists uh, were inclined to accept an atomic theory prior to the 19th century. But prior to the 19th century, there was very little specific scientific evidence for the existence of atoms. And the situation changed rapidly during the 19th century. In my judgment, the existence of atoms had been proven by 1870. Now, I don't have time in this course to go over that proof, which is why I gave you this handout the first day, where I briefly summarized what I consider to be the major pieces of evidence in favor of the atomic theory of matter that were discovered in the time period from 1800 to 1870. Um, so hopefully you've all had a chance to look over that handout um, and see the reasons for my conclusion. I'll briefly sum up what the handout contains. The evidence I cite there starts from Dalton's atomic theory, his law of multiple proportions in chemistry, which was explained, which he explained in terms of the atomic theory, it goes from that evidence to Avogadro's explanation for the law of combining volumes of gases, to the work of Dulong and Pettit in using the atomic theory to explain the heat capacities of materials to Faraday's explanation for the, um, his electrolysis experiments in terms of the atomic theory, to the early um, atomic theory of gases. Um, and I uh, explain on the last page of the handout how uh, Maxwell was able to explain uh, various properties of gases in terms of the atomic theory. And finally, toward the end of this period, scientists were able to actually calculate the size of atoms by several independent methods, which all gave results in agreement. So this is an enormous body of evidence um, that an enormous range of observed data that can be explained with the atomic theory and that no continuum theory of matter um, could explain at all. 
So what, what I tried to show in the handout was that by 1870, the atomic theory of matter had triumphed in both chemistry and physics. And the evidence in favor of atoms was overwhelming. Now, physicists are ruthlessly objective. They go by the facts, right? Wrong. Mach arrives on the, scenes in the, in, on the scene in the 1870s, shortly after the atomic theory of matter was proven. And, of course, he rejects it. Atoms are things in themselves, the reality behind the sensations. Therefore, they are transcendental metaphysics, not science, and must be thrown out. The only way the idea of atoms could possibly be justified is by arguing that the idea is a useful aid for remembering the sensations, according to Mach. But Mach claims that atoms serve no such purpose. They are too uneconomical, in his view. Now, after the great triumphs of the atomic theory, this should have been regarded as heresy. Mach's fellow physicists should have ridiculed him. They should have told him that if all he wanted to do was stare at appearances, he should find another profession. But of course, that didn't happen. Quite the opposite. His colleagues were also in the grips of Kant's philosophy, and Mach became their leader. The incredible truth is that in the late 19th century, after all the brilliant work that had proven the existence of atoms, the atomic theory was rejected by most physicists in continental Europe. Phenomenalism completely dominated physics, and Mach was the single most influential physicist throughout Austria and Germany. Does that surprise you? That is a real horror story in the history of science. Now, it is commonly thought today that the distinction between classical and modern physics arose in the 20th century with the development of relativity and quantum theory. That is not true. Physicists recognized in the 1890s that a fundamental change had taken place in their science. Heinrich Hertz, a prominent German physicist and a neo-Kantian, published a book in 1894 in which he contrasted the old physics with the new. Shortly thereafter, in the 1890s, the terms classical and modern physics came into use. So well before relativity and quantum theory. Now, in essence, the distinction is this. Classical physics holds that there is a real, causal, physical world, and the goal of physics is to discover its basic nature. Modern physics holds that there are appearances, and the goal of physics is to describe them mathematically. I'll repeat that. Classical physics holds that there is a real causal physical world and the goal of physics is to discover its basic nature. <clears throat> Modern physics holds that there, there are appearances and the goal of physics is to describe them mathematically. Now this is the distinction between Newton and Mach or even more deeply between Aristotle and Kant. Modern physics is fundamentally Kantian, and in the late 19th century, its leading representative was Ernst Mach. Now, Mach did have an opponent. <clears throat> His name was Ludwig Boltzmann, and the Machians gave him a nickname. They realized that they were tearing down the edifice of classical physics. They called Boltzmann the last pillar. Boltzmann's years are 1844 to 1906. He was Austrian, and he spent the early part of his career at the University of Graz, and the later part at the University of Vienna. Boltzmann's greatest accomplishment was to integrate the atomic theory with the field of classical thermodynamics. In particular, he was the first to grasp the physical meaning of the concept of entropy. He explained it in terms of the atomic configuration of the physical system. He was also the first to explain the way in which physical systems move toward a state of equilibrium. 
So Boltzmann was a great physicist. He had great accomplishments in, in physics. But he spent his career fighting a lonely battle. According to his fellow physicists, he committed an unforgivable sin. He dared to suppose that he could know the reality behind the appearances. He had the audacity to believe that atoms are real, just as Galileo had had the audacity to believe that he was describing reality, not appearances. Boltzmann's opposition did not come from the Catholic Church and Cardinal Bellarmino, but from the Church of Kant and Cardinal Mach. I'm sure you all know the story of Galileo's persecution. After he was forced to deny the reality of the Earth's motion, he muttered under his breath, Nevertheless, it does move. Boltzmann saw the parallel with his own situation. In a paper written in 1897, he concludes with the statement, I think I can safely say of atoms, nevertheless, they do move. Unquote. By the, by the end of the 1890s, Boltzmann realizes he is losing his battle. In the foreword to his 1898 book on the theory of gases, uh, a theory based on the existence of atoms, he writes, quote, It would be a great tragedy for science if the theory of gases were thrown into oblivion because of a temporarily hostile attitude toward it. I am conscious of being only an individual struggling weakly against the stream of time. But it still remains in my power to contribute in such a way that, when the theory of gases is again revived, not too much will have to be rediscovered." Unquote. In a lecture the following year, he expresses the same thought in a more personal way. Boltzmann was 55 when he wrote the following. I see myself as a man grown old on scientific experiences. I might even say that of those who embrace the old with a full heart, I alone am left. At least I am the only one who still fights for the old to the extent that he can. I regard it as my task in life to elaborate the classical theory as clearly and logically as possible and contribute to this theory as far as I have the power. The aim is to ensure that it need not be discovered a second time. I present myself to you, therefore, as a reactionary, a man left behind, one who is enthusiastic for the old, the classical, in the face of innovators." Unquote. <clears throat> well, innovators is a very generous term for his opponents. In this sense, Cardinal Bellarmino and the men of the Inquisition were innovators. Now, Boltzmann knew he was not a philosopher, and because of his ignorance of the field, he was at first reluctant to engage in philosophic debates. However, he eventually realized that he had no option. In order to defend the atomic theory and the ideas underlying classical physics, he found himself forced into philosophy. He remarks in a 1903 lecture, quote, while I responded with some hesitation to this call to mix in philosophy, philosophers mixed in science all the more often. Long ago they encroached on my field. I did not even understand what they meant, and so I wanted to inform myself better about the basic teachings of all philosophy. So Boltzmann begins to study philosophy in an attempt to understand the attacks on his physics. He goes on to describe what he discovered in his studies. Quote, To sample the most profound depths, I first turned to Hegel. But what an unclear, thoughtless torrent of words I found there. <laughs> Even with Kant, I had such difficulty in understanding a number of things that I thought he might be mocking the reader. Naivety here is heartbreaking. Boltzmann continues, Thus a dislike, yes, even hate, developed in me against philosophy. The most mundane things are a source of insoluble riddles to philosophy. To explain our, per <clears throat> to explain our perceptions, it constructs the concept of matter and then finds that matter is fully unsuitable for having perceptions itself or for giving rise to them in a mind. <clears throat> 
with endless cleverness that constructs the concepts of space and time and then finds it absolutely impossible that things exist in this space or that events occur in this time. It finds insurmountable difficulties in the relationship between cause and effect, between body and soul, and in the possibility of consciousness. In short, in all and everything. Yes, in the end, it finds it wholly inexplicable and self-contradictory that anything at all exists. Unquote. Now, we can only sympathize with Boltzmann's reaction to German philosophy. His reaction is perfectly conveyed in the title of a lecture that he gave to the Vienna Philosophic Society. The title was Proof that Schopenhauer was a degenerate unthinking, unknowing, nonsense scribbling philosopher whose understanding consists solely of empty verbal trash. <laughs> now that's probably the greatest lecture title in history. Now despite all that, Boltzmann did not simply reject the whole field of philosophy he still sees that philosophy is needed as a foundation for physics. He writes, quote, If real advances are possible, they are only to be expected from the collaboration between philosophy and the natural sciences. Unquote. And just as Boltzmann disagrees with Mach's pretense at rejecting philosophy, he also disagrees with Mach's rejection of theories in physics. He responds to Mach with a beautiful aphorism. Nothing is more practical than theory. Now, I don't want to leave you with the mistaken impression that in addition to being a great physicist, Boltzmann was also a great philosopher. He certainly wasn't. What was required at the time was a philosophic answer to Kant, and that was well beyond Boltzmann's capability. Boltzmann didn't believe that sense perception gave us direct awareness of entities in the world around us. Rather, he adopted the pre-Kantian representationalist view of perception, according to which we perceive only mental images, but by reasoning we can know the external world that caused the images. Okay, this was the uh, standard position in early modern philosophy from Descartes uh, through Locke. Now, how can we, by reasoning, know the external world, given that we don't, we're not directly aware of it in perception? Well, obviously we can't validate our abstract ideas by reducing them back to knowledge of reality given directly in perception, because there is no such knowledge. So instead, Boltzmann argued that an idea was true if it cohered, cohered consistently with our other ideas, and it worked in practice, that is, it led to successful action. Now, this is a weak, pragmatic epistemology. But at least he was trying to argue that there was a reality and that somehow we can know it. Very few others were even making that effort. The tragedy is that Boltzmann's confusion in philosophy led him to make disastrous concessions to his enemies. At times, he even seemed to give up the effort to convince his fellow physicists of the reality of atoms. If only they would agree that the atomic theory should be used for pragmatic reasons. In some lectures, he suggests that his claim that atoms exist is not so different from the claim that, quote, atoms are simple and useful mental representations for dealing with the observed phenomena, unquote. So Boltzmann didn't seem to realize that this sort of concession amounts to a complete surrender to Mach's view that physics just describes appearances. Now, despite all his errors, I think Boltzmann did the best he could. To illustrate how passionately he felt about his battle, I want to read you some, one of his favorite poems, along with his comments on it. Now, this is not a great poem, but it gives insight into Boltzmann. It refers to the story that Pythagoras, after discovering his famous theorem, made a sacrifice to the gods by slaughtering a hundred oxen. Okay, here's the poem. Truth stands in eternity 
If only the stupid world would recognize her light. The theorem named for Pythagoras is valid as in its time. Pythagoras dedicated a sacrifice to the gods who sent him the ray of light. One hundred oxen slaughtered and burned announced his thankfulness. Oxen since that day, when they suspect a new truth to be unveiled, raise up an inhuman roar. Pythagoras fills them with horror, and powerless to resist the light, they close their eyes and tremble. Boltzmann comments. Today, do we not hear louder than ever the bleeding of the obscurantists against the new discoveries? Yet happily for us, it is the storm heralding the coming of spring. But until then, light-hearted jest comes too soon. Until then, armed for the bitter, bloody struggle, which is not fought with powder and lead, yet has sent, sent thousands to their graves, thousands of the noblest. Unquote. <clears throat> Boltzmann was not speaking of himself when he wrote this, but he could have been. He prophesied his own fate. By 1906, he was too disgusted and discouraged to fight anymore. He committed suicide at the age of 62. Most historians of science today are anxious to offer reasons for Boltzmann's suicide that don't have anything to do with the triumph of the new physics of appearances. <clears throat> they point out that Boltzmann had health problems. His eyesight was beginning to fail. He suffered from headaches and asthma. But they failed to mention that Mach suffered from even more severe health problems, and he didn't kill himself. The historians also point out that Boltzmann suffered for years from bouts of depression. But they leave unanswered the question of what he was depressed about. The central value in Boltzmann's life was his work in physics. The only explanation I can accept for his suicide is that he no longer felt the desire to continue that work. And I think we can guess the reason that he lost the desire. He could and did love classical physics, but he could feel nothing but repugnance for the new Kantian physics. What could he do when he was alone, overcome by disgust, and didn't even know how to fight his opponents? He ended his life and left the battle to us. Now, where do we go from here? The last pillar of classical physics has fallen, and we're into the 20th century. Germany, the land of Kantian philosophers, is now the acknowledged center of theoretical physics in the world. And next, I need to tell you about relativity and quantum mechanics, the 20th century theories of physics that came out of Germany. But before I do, let me wrap up a few points. First, who won the battle between Mach and Boltzmann? Now, strangely enough, almost all historians of science say that Boltzmann won. That it is a sad irony that he committed suicide right about the time that physicists accepted the atomic theory. Now, I disagree with the historians for one primary reason. Fundamentally, the disagreement between Mach and Boltzmann was not about atoms. It was about the philosophic foundations of physics. Does physics study the basic nature of the physical world, or does it give mathematical descriptions of appearances? Now, on this issue, Mach scored a decisive victory. Physicists accepted Kant's definition of their science. Einstein once made the following very perceptive remark about Mach's influence. Quote, I believe that those who consider themselves opponents of Mach scarcely know how much of Mach's outlook they have, so to speak, absorbed with their mother's milk. That's absolutely true. Um, and Einstein was at least philosophically astute enough to recognize it. Now, to drive home how much physicists did absorb from Mach, I want to read you a fascinating passage from a book entitled the Grammar of Science. Uh, I refer, this book is on the reading list uh, that I passed out the first day with the course outline. The book is by Carl Pearson, uh, an English scientist and positivist 
and the first edition was published in 1892. Now this book I found very uh, valuable reading as evidence of how dominant Mach's ideas were, even in England. In the preface to the third edition, which was issued in 1911, Pearson writes, quote, Reading the book after many years, it was surprising to find how the heterodoxy of the 1880s had become the commonplace and accepted doctrine of today. He's writing in 1911 now. Nobody believes that science explains anything. We all look on it as a shorthand description, an economy of thought. It seems almost unnecessary now to republish the book, the lesson of which is that objective matter and force have nothing whatever to do with science and that Adam and Ether are merely intellectual concepts solely useful for the purpose of describing our perceptual routine. What possible purpose, then, can this new edition serve? In other words, everyone's already accepted my point of view. Why am I bothering to reissue the book? But now he identifies a purpose. He says there's still an idea from the old physics that has not yet been completely destroyed. Um, those are my words. I'm continuing with Pearson's quote now. Beyond such dark, discarded fundamentals as matter and force lies still another fetish amidst the inscrutable arcania of science, namely the category of cause and effect. Is this category anything but a conceptual limit to experience and without any basis in perception beyond a statistical approximation? This idea will be scouted now, but the real question is, what will men of science be saying 20 years hence?" Unquote. Well, Pearson knew the nature of the change that had occurred in physics, and he even guessed where the new physics was heading. And he was right. We'll see that in less than 20 years after that passage was written, physicists explicitly rejected causality. But this was predicted decades in advance by a number of people, Pearson, Mach, um, those who, who understood philosophy and the direction physics was headed, um, realized that causality was on its way out. Now, I have a lot of material left to cover. But in my judgment, we've already seen the climax of the story I'm telling in this course. There's a parallel here with Shakespeare's tragedy Othello. Recall the climactic scene in the third act where the hero Othello kneels and pledges his allegiance to the villain Iago. At that point, the audience knows Iago is in control and disaster is inevitable. If the history of physics were a tragedy, and it is, I would say that the climax was in the 1890s. That was when physicists knelt down in unison and vowed allegiance to Kant. Now, we'll see how the story unfolds in the 20th century, but at this point you should be able to guess. Okay, any questions? Um, because I'm, I'm about to dive into the 20th century uh, um, now, so the only way you can prevent me from doing that um, is to ask me a question. Yes? Excuse me? You lost in piano Europe and you found a statue to Boltzmann. Oh, oh, that story. Okay, thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, there, there's an interesting uh, story about Boltzmann. You, you can see from what I've told you so far how this poor man was persecuted during his lifetime and ostracized by the majority of the physics community um, to the point where he thought that uh, all he could do was try and save the atomic theory and, I mean, record his ideas on the atomic theory and the theory of gases so that not too much would have to be rediscovered uh, later. Now, after Boltzmann died, physicists did um, accept the atomic theory, at least for pragmatic use. We'll see the sense in which they accepted it later. Um, and Boltzmann was rehabilitated after his death into a hero. 
Um, he was buried in the cemetery at Vienna, and they made a huge marble bust of Boltzmann. Beneath the bust, uh, they, they have his equation for entropy. And then beneath that, they have uh, the words, was it a god who wrote these signs? Now, that kind of hypocrisy, um, claiming Boltzmann as a hero to glorify the, uh, the Austrian culture, um, after, in effect, he was killed by that Austrian culture, um, I, uh, I thought was uh, somewhat <laughs> offensive. Um, and I remember trying to express, find the words to express what I thought about that hypocrisy and being reminded of a brilliant passage in Ayn Rand's journal where she talks about exactly this phenomenon in the Atlas journals, the way in which um, cultures will oppose a great man in every way possible and sometimes drive him to death, and then after they've killed him, um, claim him as a great hero to prove uh, how wonderful their, their culture is. Um, so that's the, the epilogue to the Boltzmann story. Okay, well, um, any, any other questions? Okay, well, we can get a start on uh, this next uh, section then and leave us a little bit more time uh, tomorrow. Okay, well, we finally made it to the 20th century. Kant's anti-Copernican revolution has taken over physics, which is now acknowledged as the science that gives mathematical descriptions of appearances. In the first decade of our century, a young genius develops the first fundamental theory of the new Kantian physics. That is, the first mathematical theory of appearances. The genius, of course, is Albert Einstein, and the theory is relativity. Now, Einstein's years are 1879 to 1955. He grew up in Munich, Germany, and went to college in Zurich, Switzerland receiving his Ph.D. in physics from the University of Zurich in 1905. Now, 1905 was a banner year for Einstein. At the age of 26, while working in the Swiss Patent Office, he finished his dissertation and wrote three landmark papers in physics, one of which was his first paper on relativity. Now, Einstein was an historic genius. In his capacity to think creatively about the fundamental concepts at the foundations of physics, he was second only to Newton. Einstein once said that as a student, he realized that the separate fields of physics could, quote, devour a short working life without satisfying the hunger for deeper knowledge, unquote. It was then that he decided to, quote, send out the paths that led to the depths and disregard everything else, all the many things that clutter up the mind and divert it from the essential." Unquote. Now, the ability to do that is the hallmark of genius. Unfortunately, Einstein was a genius in the same sense that Plato was, not because of the truth of his ideas, but because he thought originally on the widest level of abstraction in his field. Einstein's tragedy was that he applied his genius only within physics. He was remarkably unoriginal philosophically. He simply absorbed his philosophic ideas from the culture around him and then used his genius to reconstruct the foundations of physics in accordance with those ideas. So before we can begin to discuss Einstein's physics, um, I first need to tell you about the philosophy that Einstein accepted. And we'll go ahead and make a start on this uh, today. I don't know whether I'm uh, going fast here and discouraging questions in some way, um, because I'm actually ahead of where I was when I've given this course before. But uh, if uh, I hope I'm not uh, blowing you away. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. All right, first point of Einstein's philosophy. Einstein was a phenomenalist. Shouldn't surprise you. He agrees with Kant that we are not directly aware of an independent world, but only of a manifold of sensations that we order by means of concepts. I quote from Einstein's book, Essays in Physics. The first step in constructing the idea of a real external world is the formation of the concept of bodily objects. Out of the multitude of our sense experiences, we take, mentally and arbitrarily, certain repeatedly occurring complexes of sense impressions, and we attribute to them the meaning of a bodily object. Considered logically, this concept is an arbitrary creation of the human mind. The very fact that the totality of our sense impressions is such that by means of thinking it can be put in order, this fact is one which leaves us in awe, but which we can never understand. One may say the eternal mystery of the world is its comprehensibility. It is one of the great realizations of Immanuel Kant that the setting up of the real external world would be senseless without this comprehensibility. Unquote. So Einstein views it as a miracle that we can impose arbitrary concepts on a chaotic stream of sensations and thereby create an intelligible world. And he has a point. If that was what we did, it would be a miracle, right? Okay, point number two in Einstein's philosophy. And this is going to sound like I'm just repeating what I said about Mach, but uh, we'll get to some differences in a minute. Einstein was a nominalist. Now you can already see that from the quote that I just read. Uh, Einstein believes that concepts are arbitrary constructs that refer either to groups of other concepts or to groups of sensations. There is no logical procedure in guiding us in creating them. They are free inventions of the human mind. The only test of their validity is our success in using them. Now again, from Einstein's Essays in Physics, quote, In my opinion, nothing can be said concerning the manner in which concepts are to be made and connected, and how we coordinate them to the experiences. In guiding us in the creation of such an order of sense experiences, success in the result is alone the determining factor. All that is necessary is the statement of a set of rules. One may compare the, these rules with the rules of a game, in which, while the rules themselves are arbitrary, it is their rigidity alone that makes the game possible. However, the fixation of the rules will never be final. There are no final categories in the sense of Kant." Unquote. So what is Einstein saying? He's saying that, in essence, he accepts Kant's subjectivism, but denies the necessity of his categories. Now this is the standard neo-Kantian view. In effect, it is Kant plus choice. Um, all we're aware of is an inner world of, uh, that is this manifold of sensation. What we do in concepts, Kant says, is we have these innate concepts that automatically arrange and order that manifold of sensations in a certain way that we have no choice about. The basic, our basic conceptual structures we have no choice about. What the neo-Kantians did was simply add choice to the conceptual realm. They said, well, the, all we have are this manifold of sensations, but we can choose to conceptualize it any way we want. Um, so it's, it's arbitrary. Um, concepts are, quote, free inventions of the human mind in one of Einstein's most famous phrases. Okay, now up to this point, we could say that Einstein's views closely follow those of Mach. But here is where he parts company with Mach. Point number three, Einstein was a rationalist. 
Now recall that Mach despised theory. He thought it could only be justified as a temporary prop, an aid to arriving at the, mathemat at the final mathematical description of the sensations. After one reaches the equations, one should throw the theory away, according to Mach. But Einstein is, above all, a theorist. He could not possibly accept such a view. He agrees with Mach that theories cannot be induced from experience, but he nevertheless holds that they are indispensable. Einstein simply rejects the inductive method in science. Again, from Einstein's book, Essays in Physics, quote, there is no inductive method that could lead to the fundamental concepts of physics. Failure to understand this fact constituted the basic philosophic error of so many investigators of the 19th century. Logical thinking is necessarily deductive. It is based on hypothetical concepts and axioms." Unquote. Elsewhere in the same book, Einstein writes, quote, We now realize how much in error are those theorists who believe that theory comes inductively from experience. Even the great Newton could not free himself from this error." Unquote. Well, good for Newton, right? Um, may we all commit the error of basing our abstractions on reality. Unfortunately, Einstein avoided this so-called error in constructing the basic concepts of relativity. Now, notice that rather than rejecting the arbitrary, as Newton did, Einstein accepts it explicitly and on principle. In his view, the theorist necessarily starts with the arbitrary. There isn't any other place to start. There is no way to get our theoretical concepts from experience. Um, now, it was actually in large part the, um, the rationalism of modern Big Bang cosmology is, I think, due in, in large part to Einstein's influence here. Okay, now I'll give you one more quote as a demonstration of Einstein's rationalism. In uh, another of his books, uh, Relativity, the Special and General Theory, he writes, quote, Why is it necessary to drag down from the Olympian fields of Plato the fundamental ideas in natural science and attempt to reveal their earthly lineage. You get that question? Why is it necessary to drag down from the Olympian fields of Plato the fundamental ideas in natural science and attempt to reveal their earthly lineage? Einstein answers, in order to free these ideas from the taboo attached to them, and thus achieve greater freedom in the formation of ideas and concepts. It is to the immortal credit of David Hume and Ernst Mach that they, above all others, introduced this critical conception. Now, what did Einstein mean by that? Well, according to Einstein, we could be content to play in Plato's world of forms if it were not for those great champions of earthly observation, Hume and Mach. Now, may Aristotle forgive me for reading that quote. <clears throat> now, of course, Einstein's method is somewhat better in practice than it is in theory. Otherwise, he couldn't have accomplished anything. But you can see how bad his philosophic ideas were. Um, I have exactly a quarter after, so I'm supposed to wrap up here. Um, I think what I'll do is, it, this last point I have to tell you about in Einstein's philosophy is very short, but I'll save it for next time. So we'll draw a line here. Thank you. This course continues with lecture four.